Hello, everyone. Welcome this evening to this wonderful conversation that we're about to have with an amazing set of panelists. My name is Stacy Rutland. I'm founder of Income Movement. I'm really excited to have everybody here this evening um, to join us for what's going to be, I know, a very important and powerful conversation. Uh, the title of this event is Equity, Safety, and Autonomy, Building Economic Systems that Support Women. And um, this is the third of a three-part series that we've been doing on guarantee income uh, over the last three weeks. The first was around, the title was Why Cash Matters, and really focused on thinking about how to shift um, shift our programs towards direct cash um, when it comes to supporting uh, and offering guaranteed income or supporting people um, in our social safety net. Last week was, um, was looking at the intersectionality of race, class, and guaranteed income. And then today we're focusing on uh, gender and women. Um, I want to uh, first uh, do a little bit of housekeeping um, before we actually get started, but I'm going to be quick because we have such amazing people today. I want to make sure we have as much time as possible to hear from them. First, I want to thank our partners, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income and Inherent Good, the film documentary that we actually showed before this event. Um, they have been integral to making this panel series possible. So thank you so much for everybody that's that's been working behind the scenes to bring us all here together today. This event, each of the event series and this event specifically is focused on a different uh, geographic region in the United States. Today we're focusing on the Midwest and kind of upper Great Lakes area. And so you'll see that a lot of our panelists are elected officials um, who come from um, those regions. And we're specifically focusing in that way because we've invited mayors, um, we've invited small business owners in the region to come and actually hear from their elected officials, from people in their community who are supporting guaranteed income with the goal of further growing um, the, the movement around really working towards direct cash. So welcome everybody who's from the Midwest, you know, Great Lakes region, happy to have you here, really excited to have this conversation. Um, we have a long, if this is the first time you've been to Crowdcast, it's pretty straightforward, um, very similar to probably, you know, if you've been experiencing Zoom and some of the other larger platforms. Um, the, the key here for you guys is obviously comments in on the right side, uh, chat will be going the whole time. Love to see the comments and thoughts of people as they're hearing from uh, the panelists. There's also a ask a question button at the bottom, and this is where you should definitely drop any questions you have for panelists as we have the conversation. We'll be monitoring that regularly. The the event tonight is going to um, is going to start with a one on one conversation with Representative Rashida Talib um, from Michigan's 13th district. Really excited to have her here. And she's going to set, help us set the foundation for many of the topics we're going to be covering. Um, when we, uh, from there, we will go ahead and open it up to the larger panel discussion. And so, um, so when that happens, we'll have a panel discussion with some uh, kind of preset questions that we know are going to help us dive into things for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then we'll reserve the last 15 minutes of today. Um, for questions uh, that come from the audience. So we'll definitely get to as many of those questions as possible um, when we are um, kicked off. So with no further ado, I would like to, I'm getting a call and I think it's from, um, I think that it might be from Mayor Carter. So hold on just one moment. So with no further ado, I would love to, um, to bring up uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib. So I'm gonna bring her audio and video up. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Thank God you knew how to unmute me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for creating space. But I also love, I come from the grassroots like movement work. So what just happened just is refreshing actually. So I appreciate it. Uh, and really um, I'm so honored to be part of this incredible um, conversation about something that really is important to my district. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have you here and excited to talk a little bit about, we thought what would be a good way to start is to talk about um, some of the direct legislation that you've actually been responsible for. Um, you've done, you know, really spearheaded so many really important pieces, but of course tonight we're talking about direct cash 
and um, and why we want to be moving towards direct cash and the impact of that potentially on women and families. So, um, so I want to ask you uh, first a question about your Boost Act. I know that um, in 2019 you presented the Boost Act to the House, and this was before pre-pandemic, and that legislation was really designed to give monthly um, a monthly distributed kind of stipend or income to um, individuals or families. And so I would love to understand, obviously with the American Rescue Plan, we have the child tax credit and, and we really have started to see some real momentum build around direct cash, monthly direct cash going to, um, to families. But can you tell me a little bit more about why you decided when you were building the Boost Act, why cash was so important? Yeah, and for, Everyone listen, you know, it really came from the community, uh, really. I had a round table uh, with mothers, uh, uh, not only mothers that were taking care of their children, but also taking care of their elderly, like parents. Um, also, uh, many at the table were, um, you know, the lead breadwinners, as you would call it, in their homes. And so for me, I wanted to be able to do something that would change lives immediately. And so what you have is the Boost Act, which you know, would uplift 45% of people in poverty in the United States right now would be uplifted with the Boost Act. And why it was done in the way that it was done is very uh, broad, inclusive, uh, was because at that table, you know, many, many um, folks know this, I represent the third poorest congressional district. And what happens there is you don't see a shift or a change immediately because some of these programs in so-called you know, tax credits and these uh, various ways of folks wanting to approach poverty uh, has set requirements. And so the way we drafted the Boost Act is look, as mothers, especially uh, folks that for me are providing you know, a, a huge uh, benefit by helping raise their children, uh, community. I wasn't raised by one mother, I always tell people, but uh, if you were raised in Detroit, you were raised by all the mothers in the block. And so the Boost Act would be three to $6,000 per year of anybody making um, less than $100,000 to zero income and uh, very inclusive as well. One of the things I love is it includes students, includes folks that are caretakers for their uh, loved ones. Uh, again, because of all the various broken systems that many of our residents are living with, uh, it had to ha had to be something that was immediate and broad, and again, very inclusive. And again, you know, when I talk about this, I love it because when I walk through the community, residents literally yell out "boost." Nice. This is exactly what they want their tax dollars to be used for: is investment in them. Uh, and I know economists and others said this is the closest thing to a universal basic income proposal, uh, but also that this is how you actually support real uh, local communities, uh, not with these you know, broad brushes that really just help those that um, are not really the most vulnerable at the time, even though they need it. We, we don't approach it the way I think uh, as somebody that's a social worker at heart, uh, in a way that again is is very inclusive and doesn't create barriers uh, to seek out that help. So that you know, I I want to then carry us into the ABC Act, which is in some ways kind of the extension of you know when the pandemic hit, you immediately I think you were one of the first in the house to say like okay, what are we going to do here to try to um, to alleviate as much of the loss of income that people are having right now due to the pandemic, and um, and so your the the Boost Act was was about distributing two thousand dollars a month to person to every person um, during the pandemic, um, and you had some really great and interesting ways of paying for it, and and it is just incredibly creative and innovative, the the way that you um, started to think about that. But one of the things that for me when I was reading it and at Income Movement when we were reading through your um, your legislation was how you wanted to distribute the funds. And and um, so you were thinking about distributing with debit cards, yeah. um, kind of unique specific debit cards for the distribution. Can you tell us a little bit about why you felt debit cards was so important? Yeah, and this is my own personal experience even with my mother, uh, you know, Many of my neighbors are uh, unbanked or underbanked. And so just to even go further in regards to that, I, you know, the automatic boost to communities act 
was really a response, kind of this aggressive response, I call it, uh, to what we need, which is a people's bailout, when we see these high rates of unemployment in jobs that really have just disappeared completely because of a global pandemic. And so the biggest difference we can make is direct cash. But then we have to realize the most vulnerable, the underbanked, unbanked, I think it's about 25% across the country, uh, the, you know, having them, uh, you know, wait for a check to be, uh, you know, sent to the home um, through, through mail, but then also most of my neighbors, and I again saw my mother doing this, go to the local party store or a store, get like $300, 3% knocked off of whatever that check is just to get a cash because the transportation barriers, uh, the fact that many of these um, banks are not like one of those that are very accessible because I always tell people, my folks are the ones who work the longer hours that are after hours uh, because, you know, and all these kinds of different, uh, again, challenges for many of my frontline workers. So it was important for me that it was accessible, but think about it, y'all. Like it's $2,000 on a debit card that can just be, be recharged instead of people waiting for the for it to come through the through the mail but also it is can be used you know for the things that you might think of groceries other items um and and, and you know again fitting to the fact that it is a global pandemic i wanted again something that um uh to me could be universally used uh people can have the option but even for um uh some residents who were like well what is it and i tell them it's like a actual debit card y'all <laughs> We used to start with food assistance, and I remember my mother we had food assistance. It was the little booklet and this, you know, the paper, and then it became the, you know, we call it here in Michigan the bridge card and and so forth. Uh, then why aren't we doing that for direct aid during this pandemic? This, you know, survival checks that need to happen, and I think it's important, you know, as we think about these things, the aggressiveness towards the big corporations. I hear this kind of like urgency uh, to help them out, but then we don't move that same urgency when it comes to the people and the residents. And again, what I love is that, you know, they get the money, they spend it right in their neighborhood, in their community. So that money stays right in the community uh, where with corporations, y'all like, you know, it goes to shareholders, we don't know. And then we find out later on that, oh, our neighbors that were working for the company are still getting laid off. I mean, is it wasn't that so they can keep those jobs uh, on the line. So. Uh, again, I I love that it's it's something that people are like mm, I don't know about now, but I know it's going to be something that is uh, when we look back, just like with food assistance, uh, it was the best thing to do for the American people. And I think one of the things that struck us, and we have um, Sonia Passi on tonight as one of the panelists who is CEO of Free From and works specifically around. Um, economic justice, economic access for um, for uh, survivors of domestic violence. And one of the things we just, that was so powerful about the debit cards is it really actually bypasses, you know, a lot of people who are living in, um, in domestic violence situations, they don't have access to bank accounts. There might be some for the household, but they don't get to have access. And the distribution of those cards, you talked about like having it be something that, you know, going to local post offices, there, that there'd be a, a wide range of options for people to go to access them, which means that there's a possibility for women in this moment mm -hmm. to actually, with their kids have money for the first time that might actually help them leave rather than what we've seen right now during the pandemic, which is this huge, massive increase of, um, of domestic violence. And, you know, yeah, and my, my sister Layla works with survivors of domestic violence and, you know, the coalition here in Michigan, that's the first thing they said is our, our, the survivors can't get access to the stim, the, the survival checks. Um, I also talked to some of my, you know, a whole, you know, full advocates that work on homelessness in our city uh, and throughout really uh, my district, talking about how that would be life changing to be able to get these debit cards uh, in the hands of folks that can be able to be again mobile and so forth. But it it, it is the cash, um, uh, you know, the check process, all that has really uh, just not worked for everyone, and and especially because no matter even the ones who are banked, they're finding. Uh, the the process of even just getting it cash with their bank. Uh, it, it's just so many, again, 
simplicity when it comes to the debit card. It just it makes complete sense that we're doing it. But I, I love that you mentioned the survivors because it's something my sister consistently says. It's great, the child tax credit, all this, but Rashida, we're dealing with people and folks that all those, the safety net, everything is just not there. But for us to be able to access, uh, you know, the cards. And, and if you look at my bill, I specifically say we have to work with some of these organizations, including those that work with our homeless neighbors and those who work with survivors and other really uh, vulnerable communities. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I know you have another thing to come to um, to go to. So I really appreciate you taking some time um, and uh, talking more about policy and thinking outside of the box and, and really rethinking how we um, support everybody, but also if we're supporting women and uh, we know that we're supporting the larger community. So appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Here. Thank you all for your work. It's really thank important. Uh, I, on behalf of my residents, thank you. They can't be always be part of these uh, efforts, uh, but you would change their lives forever if we can actually get this done. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Okay. Yay. Oh, I love Representative Tlaib. She's just been such a such a crusader on this on this really important critical topic. The one that so many of us here are just fighting every day, working every day towards. So wonderful to have her here to help kind of lay the, the foundation. So I'm going to um, to now start to hand things over to our um, our host and um, and facilitator tonight. And so I'm bringing Almas Zalecki up. Hello, Almas. Hello. So lovely to see you. So, um, so I'm going to introduce you, and then I'm actually just going to hand the reins over to you, and I'm going to go away so that you guys can all, um, the panelists, and you can have a, an awesome conversation. But I want to make sure that um, that I introduce you properly. So Almas is a professor of practice and political science at NYU Shanghai. Um, she has a has focused a lot of her work on feminist political theory hence why she's so valuable here today as well as the ethics of unconditional guaranteed income so she's been in this space for many many years and we're really um, excited to have her guide us through the conversation today so welcome Almas. thank you so much stacy i'm really looking forward to the conversation with our panelists so let me go ahead and introduce our panelists and ask them to um, join us up here on the screen. Um, so first is uh, Sonia Passi, who is the CEO of Free From, an organization working at the nexus of economic system reform and domestic violence survivor support. Free From works to integrate, to integrate financial capacity services in the anti-domestic violence movement creating tools and resources that help support survivor collective economic power and removing structural obstacles to survivors' financial security. So, welcome, Sonia. Um, next is uh, Mayor Satya Rhodes-Conway, and she is mayor of Madison, Wisconsin, and part of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. The Guaranteed Income pilot in her region hopes to target 100 local families and they're in the fundraising phase of planning. And we just heard um, in the green room that uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway has already secured a good amount of money towards, um, the, towards the demonstration. So that should be launching soon, I hope. So welcome, uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. And um, next is Teresa Funicello. Teresa has been an advocate for welfare and social safety net reform for decades, focused on a shift towards more dignified income support systems for women and children. Her book, Tyranny of Kindness, highlighted the nightmare of our welfare system through powerful human stories and revealed the lucrative industry built around our welfare system that contributes to the continued cycle of poverty. Welcome, Teresa. And I think I just invited her. I just invited moments ago Mayor Carter up. So we'll, I, I think that he has gotten the prompt. Um, let me re-prompt and see if he can join us. Shall I introduce him anyway while he's- Let's coming? introduce him, let's do it. <laughs> so we're ready for him. So Mayor Melvin Carter, um, who should be joining us momentarily, is mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. And he's an avid proponent for guaranteed income and also part of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. 
the People's Prosperity Pilot in St. Paul specifically targets families who have been negatively impacted by COVID and is using a hybrid of private and public funds to pay for it. He's coming. I see him. It just takes a moment to get into the into the um, into the software. There's like okay. a second web. I'm going to leave the screen so you guys can all be here. So um, thank you everyone for being here. Excited to see you. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for um, Mayor Carter to join us, I'd like to start actually with a question to you, Sonia, because our conversation with um, Representative Talib just focused on legislation that would design um, income support systems that in particular work for women and for mothers. So I wanted to dive into this topic from a different angle. Um, what are some specific ways uh, that you can identify that our economic or financial systems fail to protect or support uh, people in abusive relationships? The majority, not all, but the majority of whom are women. What changes could we make to better support survivors of domestic abuse? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be part of this conversation. Just to kind of set the scene of where we're at, one in four women, one in two trans folks in the US will experience intimate partner violence. And the number one obstacle to survivor safety is financial insecurity. Um, and that's for two reasons. The first is it's incredibly expensive to experience intimate partner violence. The CDC estimates that intimate partner violence will cost a female survivor an average of $104,000. And then on top of that, in 99% of cases, survivors experience economic abuse as part of the harm. And that can look like anything from not being allowed to work, working, but having to hand over your paycheck, having credit cards and debt in your name that you don't know about that's damaging your credit, um, having, ca having bank accounts that you don't know about, uh, being given an allowance, having to explain every cent that you spend. And so already the setup of this issue, you know, we think about intimate partner violence so much as like a crisis issue that can sort of be addressed with short-term relief, like shelters and public assistance. But actually what we're talking about is an economic issue. And it really requires all pillars of our economic systems to come together and do their part. For example, 52% of survivors do not have safe access to a bank account. Um, the only people who can do anything about that are banks, supporting customers who experience intimate partner violence in, in keeping their bank accounts safe and keeping their information safe, their data safe so that they cannot be monitored online by a harm doer, for example. 60% of survivors lose their job as part, as a result of the abuse. And so, you know, if you think about financial security, there is no financial security without employment. And so what is the role that our employers have to pay in ensuring that survivors can actually take time off to deal with the harm that they've experienced in a way um, that doesn't mean they have to lose their job if they don't have enough accrued vacation days, for example. And so really there's so, you know, so often we, we ask the question of like, what can women do to help themselves in these situations? And, and I think the better question is what can we all do? What can our systems do? How can our, uh, our financial institutions um, and structures make it so that intimate partner violence does not automatically result in poverty um, as the only outcome. Thank you. And the way you've described this, um, in fact, you've really broadened the idea um, beyond just domestic violence, right? There's There are a lot of women um, and, and uh, you know, people of any gender who might be um, facing this kind of economic intimidation by a partner. And so, direct cash to individuals can really make a difference for a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so let me open it up to um, our other panelists. Uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway, what about you? What do you, what do you think are um, some other ways that our safety net and other social institutions fail to support women and what, what changes can we make? Where would you like to start? <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what comes immediately to mind 
for me is that, it, you know, over the past year plus in the course of the pandemic, we have just been presented um, time and time again with examples of how our economic system doesn't value women's work. Um, and so I think about, you know, whether that's from um, the nursing profession, which is predominantly female, um, uh, you know, it being subjected to not only 12 hour shifts, but, you know, multiple shifts in a row in, um, you know, very difficult, if not life threatening working conditions, uh, dealing with a global pandemic. Uh, you know, and certainly not getting compensated um, to, you know, to the level that their work is worth or to, you know, workers on the front line um, of any industry. I think about particularly restaurant industry and the workers that were so vulnerable in the course of the pandemic, either because there was no more job for them or because they were forced to work in situations that put them and their families in harm's way. And I think about, you know, across this country, at least schools shut down or or went virtual, whatever that actually means. And, you know, most of the care and responsibility for dealing with that fell on the shoulders of women. And, it, you know, our our entire system of dealing with the pandemic hasn't recognized um, the immense labor that women have had to do for which they have not been paid. Uh, you know, virtual schooling doesn't work without an adult helping to facilitate that. Um, so, I, you know, I just think that like so many other things, the pandemic really laid bare the fact that we do not compensate women for the work they do in our society. And, um, and so, you know, what to do about that? Well, maybe we should compensate people. Um, it, you know, certainly there's all sorts of policy solutions there. You could talk about, um, you know, providing living wages. You could talk about raising the minimum wage. You could talk about working conditions and, um, and unions and, you know, all sorts of things. But, you know, I do think that, that you know, part of why I'm part of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income and, and part of why we're pushing uh, for a national guaranteed income program is because, there is a certain level to which just direct cash payments would support uncompensated care work and, and allow people in their lives to just have a little bit more space um, at, you know, to take care of themselves and their families. And I think that, um, you know, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder here, but I think what we saw out of the Stockton pilot uh, is exactly that, right? That when people were given direct funding, and that they were able to um, put themselves in a better situation economically, in a better situation in terms of their employment conditions, um, and in a better situation in terms of their health and their mental health. And so I do think that, you know, while there's a lot of ways in which we could improve um, our policy surrounding our economic conditions for women, um, I do think that guaranteed income fits very nicely into that and is one of the important tools that we should be using. Thank you. And, and you've really highlighted a lot of the issues around um, employment um, and the ability, what makes it possible for, for women to, to work, um, particularly during the pandemic, really um, women are disproportionately responsible for childcare and, and all of the um, work around a family in, in normal times as well. Teresa, I'm wondering if you could um, follow up on this by talking a little bit about how the welfare system, the tradi traditional welfare system that we've had in this country has failed women and, how, and what we could do to improve it. And you need to unmute, I think. devalues women in a way that you can't quite imagine unless you've been there. You don't have a, a right to anything. You will say that when you go to sign up for it. The day you sign up for welfare is the day you give up all your rights. That's what one worker actually told one of the women that I know. Um, the thing is, if a, a man batters you, you can have, you, some people care. But if the system batters you, no one really gives you. It's an entirely secret, private brutalization of the of the human as a hum, but of the human being that's woman. Um, but 
I also want to say something a little different, which is we all agree that there should be a guaranteed income, but we don't all agree, I'm sure, what form that should take. And to this point in time, the, all the proposals that I've seen, other than the ones of, of people I know, um, have been formulated by men, men who do not understand the underlying principle that if you give birth to a child, you are automatically disjointed from the marketplace. And the marketplace in any case isn't necessarily the best place to be. Um, but if it were, you'd still be unable at certain points in time. And what the pandemic proves it, that the women left work in for pay uh, all over the country and, and I'm sure in the world um, because they had to give care to their children. And that was the first impulse uh, that they had. So I'm more interested in figuring out how, how we go from where we agree there should be a guaranteed income to how that guaranteed income should be um, formulated in a way that includes a, a specific identification of caregivers as having a higher benefit level because they have a, an item that they produce, which includes human beings. Um, that is not accounted for in the current market. And, and from my perspective, what the market does, I have very little interest in, but can, you know, can discuss and I'm willing to discuss, but I don't think that's where we need to be. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, let's get back to the specifics of how the cash might work in a moment, but I wanted to um, welcome uh, Mayor uh, Carter and um, uh, I'm glad you finally made it in uh, to the panel and ask you the same question that we, we started with. What is it about um, how our um, systems have failed women, or failed to work for women um, that, that you see as um, being addressed by direct cash? Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you for your patience. I've been wrestling my uh, technology here for these past uh, 20 minutes or so and really enjoying this conversation. Um, Maybe we could say our systems have failed women. Maybe we could say our systems have succeeded to do exactly what they're designed to do uh, because those systems were not designed to support those families. Our, their systems were not designed to support those women. Our systems were not designed to support success at the molecular family and community level. And one of the things I think that many of us are trying to do in particular in the shadow of this particular crisis is say we have to completely, it's not, so much about just sort of tinkering around the edges of these systems here and there. It's not so much about changing uh, on a moderate basis, uh, a little bit at a time on an incremental basis, this system that we've had. Uh, we're 60 years into a war on poverty, we're losing, and people are asking us, why would you change strategies? It's phenomenal, the, 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 the self-defeating approach that we take uh, to the war on poverty. I've been at home. I was really intrigued by that conversation about caretakers. My wife is a midwife. She's a healthcare provider. So, uh, you know, I can do my meetings from my living room. So I've been at home with our 14 month old uh, for a significant portion of these last uh, of this last year. And it's very intriguing because I have her on my meetings and she sits here with me and she crawls over me and she, you know, uh, waves at the camera and people think it's all kind of, you know, exciting and cute and wonderful. Uh, we all know at the same time that if I was a woman, someone might suggest I get childcare and that would be more professional, that it wouldn't be received kind of in the exact same way. So we have all these types of paradoxes. I experience them uh, as an African-American man all day long. Uh, the rest of the panelists on here experience them as a woman all day long. Uh, and part of this whole thing is realizing uh, that our systems have been created by and for uh, able-bodied, uh, heterosexual, uh, white male landowners most times. And making systems that work for all of us mean not just tinkering around the edges and not even just changing what they're, what, what they're designed to do, but changing who is designed as the designers in the first place. So that's what our goal has been. Um, and the irony of guaranteed income is it's uh, controversial. Uh, the only place it's controversial is in city hall. The only place it's controversial is in halls of government. Every single neighbor knows that all of their neighbors need more access to cash right now. Everybody in the country knows that this is, a, this is a challenge, but because it's so different than what we're used to kind of thinking about, uh, it's suddenly this kind of major controversial type of thing. 
when in fact it's literally the simplest approach to ending poverty make sure people have money yeah um yeah thank you for that um you uh you touch on so many of the issues that are really important to this discussion um you know one is just the need to have um, different voices in the policy making process because you're right you know and it's great to have um uh, Representative Talib, having been part of this um, this program, we need more women in Congress um, in order to have these issues um, that are particularly uh, uh, important to women um, and have policy designed for women to have that become um, you know an issue in Congress. And I was really taken by the fact that she said in her comments that the idea for direct cash came from the community. And um, Teresa, you know as well as I do that. Um, women who were recipients of welfare back in the 60s um, were fighting for um, guaranteed income as well, right? So when you ask the people who are doing the work of, of caring for the next generation, um, of, of doing the work in our communities, they're, they're unanimous, right? Cash works, um, but we still find this um, reluctance on the part of uh, you know, policymakers um, to, to go in that direction. But since we're all agreed that, that cash is what works, let's talk a little bit about the specific implementation. Um, again, uh, Representative Talib talked about um, uh, debit cards as being an important facet um, of, of implementation. Teresa, you brought up the question of uh, a supplement for caregivers. So why don't we start with you and then I'd like to go around to everybody and, and, and hear what you think of in terms of how we tailor um, uh, cash grants in you know, specific terms so that they're most effective, particularly for women and caregivers. Teresa, do you want to unmute and start? Well, the way I went back, how it was that women, be, women's work, so so to speak, became so devalued, and the answer to that question led me to a lot of other things, and it, you know, in very simple terms, the industrial revolution, they needed laborers, they did, mostly wanted male laborers, and the male laborers wanted to be identified as better because of what they did for the for the industrialists. And suddenly work, which had been something women and men did in common before there were industrialists, was just work. And this thing became work. <laughs> and that was the thing for which you got paid. And the other thing was the thing you did for human beings to exist. And that so amazingly became irrelevant. And if you Start where it happened, then you can think of what people need in a different way, what women need, what, I mean, which is not to say you only need it if you're going to give care at home. There's a, whether you give care or not, somebody needs to take care of the kids. And it should be your decision how that comes about, not some bureaucracy's decision. And the only mechanism for that to happen is a guaranteed income that has a modification that includes a greater sum for the people who give care to everyone else, whether it's care to adults or to children. Okay, let me, yes, thank you. Let me get some other perspectives on this. Um, uh, maybe let's start with you, um, Mayor Rose Conway. What do you think in terms about this implementation, either following on that um, particular question that um, uh, Teresa raised about a supplement for caregivers or any other um, implementation aspects that you think are particularly important for supporting women? Yeah, I, you know, um, I guess I come at this with a, a, a particular bias uh, because I'm in local government um, it, and often we're faced with situations where um, you know, there is a, a theoretical best approach um, uh, which might get in the way of us actually getting anything done. Um, I, I think from a, a local government perspective, the simpler, the better, the more straightforward, the better, um, the more understandable to a broad range of people, the better. Um, and so, you know, we're, I think, and I don't, I don't want to speak for Mayor Carter or for Mayors for a Guaranteed Income as an organization, but I think that one of the, the purposes of us coming together as mayors across the country, and I think, Mayor Carter, there's 47 of us now involved uh, in Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, um, 
is to really be able to make a national case for this, to show that, a, a, you know, just one version of a guaranteed income program. And, and you know, for the most part, the cities that, that have pilots going on are, are I think, looking at um, $500 a month per household for a year. And we're all working with the same folks uh, who will be tracking the data and, and asking the questions and, and doing the surveys around impact so that we really can um, bring those data together across multiple cities to make a national case. And um, so, sorry, I just wanted to set that as sort of the surround of how I'm thinking about this, right? Um, so, you know, would it, would it in an ideal world be good to have a supplement for caregiving? Yes, absolutely. Um, would it be good to have um, a, a sort of direct setup for folks who are uh, experiencing houselessness? Um, you know, I look to the program that Vancouver did uh, with folks that are, are experiencing houselessness, and, and I think that's really impressive results, right? So yes, I'd love to do that too, right? But I, I also think there's a certain extent to which, uh, you know, this is going to be an absolutely uphill battle to get this accomplished at the federal level. And so um, focusing on something that is uh, perhaps good enough, <laughs> um, that gets us started, that gets the concept uh, familiarized and, um, and presumably popular uh, enough so that we could then add on um, things that, that spoke to more uh, specific populations, I think is, is where I would lean. Um, in Madison, we haven't rolled out our, our program yet, um, but we are looking at uh, 500 uh, a month for a year uh, for households. Um, and, it, it, and I think that, that some of the things that, that we will consider, and actually this conversation has been very useful to me because it, it raises questions that we haven't yet been talking about. And we are using debit cards and we have a, a uh, benefits implementation partner that that's their model um, but one of the things in in the chat that went by is that um, you know we need to be careful about who in the household is is getting that debit card um, and so are we enrolling households or are we enrolling mothers are we enrolling um, caregivers are we you know so that's a question that we'll have to take back and, and wrestle with um, uh, but uh, you know given the demographics of poverty in Madison um, you know, I am trying to, you know, this is this is focused on mothers, it's focused on um, uh, lower income households and um, hopefully predominantly black and brown mothers. Um, but given also the nature of running a randomized controlled trial and how many people you need <laughs> to do that effectively to gather data that are meaningful and um, we're not able to um, fully restrict along all of those um, aspects of, of identity or, or household. And um, so, uh, so it, it will be more broadly eligible with a, a hope that we're going to enroll the target group that we're interested in um, predominantly. So thank you for that explaining the, you know, the, the realities around, you know, implementation and also uh, the d desire to collect data that can be comparable um, in these demonstrations. Sonia, I'm imagining you might have a comment though on that um, that that implementation uh, design. Yeah, absolutely. So just to give some context as to why I'm even on this panel, um, last year in response to COVID, we ran the largest cash assistance program for survivors of gender-based violence in the U.S. We were able to get grants to 4,100 survivors in all 50 states in Puerto Rico. Um, and so our experience really is very specifically with survivors. And I think it's so important to remember, even when we're talking about women, we are not isolated identities, um, race, ethnicity, survivorship, uh, sexuality, all play a part in our experience. And so one of the things that we have done is asked folks who received cash from us, what was it about that cash that made it accessible to them? And without a doubt, it was it being no strings attached, not having to provide receipts, just at a basic level. And I know that the UBI demonstrations are doing both of those. But then we actually asked folks, like, where would you want to be getting that money from? 
bank, credit union, directly from the federal government, from a culturally specific organization. So Black and Latinx survivors both said their preference would be to get that money from a bank or credit union. White survivors said their preference would be to get that money directly from the federal government. Indigenous survivors and um, Asian American survivors said they would prefer to get that money from a culturally specific organization. And so I, it's not that any one of those is right. I think actually what it is is that we need a diversity of, of facilitators of this to ensure that everyone has access. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest takeaway that we got from the survivors that we surveyed is, is for something to be truly accessible, it cannot be a one size fits all model. And, and thank you. And just to follow up on that, what about the household basis of the benefit? That's not going to be very helpful for women who are trying to escape abusive relationships if it goes to a household. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that any, any um, design of a UBI program needs to understand intimate partner violence and needs to understand economic abuse in the context of intimate partner violence. And, you know, I think it was 30% of survivors that we surveyed never got their stimulus check, not because they weren't eligible, but simply because of economic abuse. And so that's a significant percent uh, of the population um, that need to be thought of and in the, in the, in the design of this and um, seen as individuals and not a combined entity um, for the purposes of their own financial security. Thank you. Um, so Mayor Carter, let me um, wrap up by asking you to talk um, a little bit about what it is that you and the other mayors um, for guaranteed income who are engaged in these um, demonstrations are hoping to show. Because one of the things um, that we've seen in, in some um, pilots of guaranteed income around the world is a desire to show um, that receiving the payments doesn't um, uh, dis dissuade people from seeking employment. Um, so particularly around the issue of women, um, you know, in the way we've talked about the work that women um, already are doing that's not necessarily waged, what is it in particular that you're, that you're hoping to find um, as a result of these demonstrations? Uh, I appreciate the question. I had my note out, my notebook out going to school as all of these panelists have been speaking because they're, they're such powerful statements. Um, I think it's everything. I just co-sign everything that everybody said. The need for um, the need for uh, unconditional cash is so critical. The need to just consider all of these different equity points that have been laid out is just so critical. And this is, it, it, I think it channels what I was saying earlier. You know, every time we do this, every time a mayor does that, people around our own communities here, I told you she was going to come and see you guys. Say, okay, say hello. Say bye-bye. All right. <laughs> um, people say like why are you doing it this way as though there's something we've been doing to fight poverty that's been working in the past um it's not and we have to kind of push this forward we have to socialize our minds around this concept because for some reason we've found ourselves in this psychology in america where if somebody says feeding children is socialism we go oh well, then we better let those children go hungry uh, and that's insane for us so we have to normalize these kind of concepts in our minds and that's part of what we're doing on the local level as the folks in saint paul uh, when we have this conversation in Washington, D.C., they'll say, oh, I understand what that is. That's something that's really important to our community. I think that's important. We're demonstrating through evaluation across the country. And I know Mayor Rhodes Conway already talked about uh, the evaluation results, the stellar, ridiculously stellar evaluation results uh, we experienced in the Stockton pilot. St. Paul is second. Uh, we launched our pilot last fall uh, with 150 families, $500 a month for a period of 18 months. Uh, we are e evaluating uh, how this can uh, coexist uh, and maybe be uh, synergistic with our college savings account initiative in which we start every child born in our city with $50 in a college savings account. So each city will add something uh, to the to the evaluative criteria as we learn what these impacts are. If I can say one thing though about, it, about the, the implementation, and I think one of the things this is forcing, when we launched this, one of the biggest knocks on our program was how are you going to keep this from, from, from getting families kicked off of their federal and state benefit programs, right? Because we're aware of this cliff effect that means if I make one more dollar, I might lose $2 in my benefits. 
And we had to create a benefits counseling system that shows families, here's what impact this could have on your, like we have on your benefits. And indeed we've had about, I think just over a half a dozen families say, no thanks, I don't wanna do this. And what I wanna make sure that people understand is the problem isn't that we're helping low income families feed their children. The problem is that we've created a complex network of state and federal eligibility criteria that literally disincentivizes families from upward economic mobility. The problem is that we are literally saying our policy, this is exactly what structural inequity is. This is what structural racism is. And it's echoed in the families who can't take a promotion or can't take a raise or can't take a new job because they're afraid they'll lose their health care or they'll lose their child care or they'll lose their food supports or their rent supports. We have to fundamentally change the way that we uh, uh, structure our war against poverty. And it starts with evaluating and eliminating all the things in our federal and state level policy that actually are the factor that keep families stuck in those revolving doors of poverty. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Carter. We're getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted to um, bring in a question from uh, one of the members of the audience. Um, Antonius is trying to get a similar campaign started in Europe. And so he wants to hear from the mayors about what has been the most convincing argument for you and local governments to support um, guaranteed income. Uh, Mayor Rose Conway. What's been the most convincing argument that um, you've been able to use in your um, in your setting in my policy? In my policy? Uh, well, so for the the most convincing argument for me personally, what gets me what got me on board with marriage for a guaranteed income is how straightforward and simple it is, um, and how um, this is an approach that inherently trusts people to know uh, what they need and um, how best to use their resources. Um, and uh, it just feels like uh, it solves so many of the issues that we're trying to solve at the local level, but in a much more respectful and humane way. Um, so that's that's what works for me, but I'm, I am a hyper aware that <laughs> I am not uh, necessarily the, your, your average person in, in terms of who needs to be convinced on this front. Um, uh, you know, honestly, I think um, it is, this has been a fairly popular idea in Madison, Wisconsin, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, uh, but it, it, it is, I think, allowed to be popular because we are not using any city tax dollars. And um, all of the funds we will use in Madison are raised privately. Um, I think if I was trying to put this into my operating budget, it would be much, much, much more controversial. Um, and so, you know, this part of the idea of we're doing a pilot, we're trying to, to gain acceptance for the idea and proof of concept uh, is that we're using private money to do it. Um, I, but I do think that, that um, you know, just focusing on the both the aspect of trusting people and on the, um, you know, pretty strong evidence base of positive outcomes of this type of program um, is, it, to me, it is the most persuasive pieces. Thank you. And you raised an interesting question. Um, so, uh, Mayor Carter, I'm going to ask you the same question. What's been the most convincing um, in, in your city, in um, St. Paul, for getting this off the ground. But also, um, following up on what uh, Mayor Rose Conway just said, is the fact that the demonstrations are being funded by private funds, is that actually going to be a problem in trying to get this as um, to be a, a taxpayer funded program in the future, do you think? Is that going to be a challenge? Well, we our pilot is actually the first one to use tax dollars. We used uh, CARES Act dollars to help get us started and get us moving. Uh, and it was a question that people asked and they asked me why we're doing it. And I said, because our families need it and it's worthwhile. I echo what Mayor Rhodes Conway just said about the simplicity is really important. The power is really important. At this point, I think the most uh, valid argument, uh, the most powerful argument is the results, is the evaluation results uh, that uh, Stockton received. I would challenge any mayor to look at that uh, and identify a program uh, for less money uh, that can uh, that can have the types of impacts that this program has that this pilot has already been shown to have. So yes, we've had this conversation, 
And yes, it's a new stretch. We're not used to a city doing something like this. And when we do something like this all the time, people look and say, Mayor, I get that that's a problem. I get what you're saying. I get the point that you're making, but is that the proper role of city government? And I hate that question because it pretends that the proper role of city government is to repeat all the same old things that we've always done and gotten all the same old things we've always got. Uh, and that that should be a higher priority than actually meeting the needs of our constituents today. So I always push back uh, against that question. As we move forward, though, I always I, I tell my constituents really kind of directly, I'm not arguing that the city of St. Paul within our limited property tax base and local government budget uh, can afford to do something like this on a sustainable basis. Uh, we're saying uh, let's demonstrate what the power of something like this can be. And so that when we go to the state capitol, when we go to Washington, D.C., we have some real results to be able to show. We're already showing some of those results on a very short timeline. We're already being able to show some of those results. Um, and, you know, I would suggest to any mayor, any mayors that I talk to, and I'm constantly recruiting uh, for uh, mayors for guaranteed income, I would tell them one, exactly what Mayor Rhodes Conway said is uh, it's been wildly popular in our community. Uh, as folks have really got, and, and folks I wouldn't have expected to, frankly, have said, no, that really makes sense, especially now in this crisis. And we can use uh, the, the immediacy of this crisis to help demonstrate how, um, how, how powerful and transformational direct cash can be to folks. Now is the time, now is our opportunity. Thank you. Um, Teresa, did you have something that you wanted to say about um, what the best arguments are for guaranteed um, income? Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about who pays and what what we tried to do when we were trying to get the child tax credit made refundable um, and increased in value starting in around the turn of the century <laughs> um, was I went to an, um, an economist I knew who worked for the government and he agreed to run some numbers for us and I had remembered from the food stamp program back in the day that the, that the federal government had convinced states to take food stamps, which they didn't want to take, be, by explaining to them how the multiplier effect meant that more, you know, the, the value of the food stamps were three times as much to the states as, as they appeared to be in the first place. So we ran, we used a government uh, program, which was called Implan at the time, and it was used to determine any given project or, or government expenditure of significance, what, how it would affect the economy and whether it would produce the number of jobs, et cetera, they're supposed to. So what we first did is we ran the child tax credit as proposed through the system to see what it benefits states. And sure enough, states made out like fat cats. And then we ran social security through the system. And what we found was astronomical. Social security creates so much money in the economy that it's hard to imagine without looking at the direct numbers, which I could be willing to show anyone who's interested in looking. Um, but it means that it doesn't cost government to give money to people. It makes money for people and the government because all the jobs it creates, when you have to get to buy more money of food in the grocery store, the grocer has to buy more food from the, the, man, the uh, distributors and the distributors have, I mean, it goes on and on and on and more jobs get created through the system. There is no way that government loses by giving money away to anybody. Well, I think that's a wonderful way to wrap up this panel um, to talk about the multiplier effect and the effect of investing in our communities, in our families, in our children, and in um, in all the ways that we've discussed um, in this panel. So thank you all for joining us in this conversation. Um, Mayor Rhodes Conway, uh, Mayor Carter, Sonia Passi, and Teresa Funicello. And let me turn it back over to you, Stacey. Wonderful. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Almas, for guiding us through this wonderful conversation. It's been really a pleasure to just be able to sit back and listen to all of you um, talk about your experiences and and really the importance, the important work that is happening on the ground and that has been happening for um, for decades in trying to get us moving towards direct cash and what it would mean to, to women and families. So really appreciate all of you taking the time being here. We went a few minutes over, so I appreciate you guys sticking around with us. 
Um, and just a, a note to all of the audience members and even the panelists, we do have the two um, events that preceded this event series. Um, we have links to those if people weren't able to, to see them. Um, we had mayors, other mayors from Mayors for Guaranteed Income participated, Mayor Poe in Gainesville, as well as Mayor Tubbs and others, um, uh, other elected uh, representatives and other experts around a wide variety of topics. So we'll drop those in the in the chat here and I'll share them later with the panelists as well if you're interested in checking them out. But we really just had a wonderful time. I want to close by again thanking our partners, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income and Inherent Good, um, the Inherent Good production team um, who's, that is a documentary about guaranteed income that Almas is actually um, uh, featured in. A really wonderful series. I think we've gotten such amazing uh, responses and feedback from the community around the impact of these and, um, and looking forward to the next opportunities to come together and, and have these conversations. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.